Welcome everyone to uh, the first installment of our Chinese uh, Business History webinar uh, here at the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences at HKU. So the first webinar in 2021. Um, I'm joined here by my uh, colleague, Dr. John Wong, who is also, of course, um, at the Institute. And we are very happy today to welcome uh, Professor Thomas Dubois um, from Beijing Normal University to give us a talk uh, today. Um, Professor Dubois um, uh, has, um, as I think many of you will know, um, has already uh, published three uh, monographs, so he's a very prolific uh, author, um, uh, most recently uh, about uh, religion in uh, Manchuria. And uh, today uh, he is going to talk to us um, about a recent article uh, that he has published about the dairy industry uh, in uh, Yunnan. Um, and his talk is titled um, Milk from the Butterfly Spring, State of Enterprise uh, in the Yunnan Dairy Industry. Um, before we start, I should say that uh, Professor Dubois will speak for around half an hour, uh, and then we will have time for questions uh, from the audience. Um, as this is a webinar setting, please uh, make sure to ask your questions through the Q&A button in Zoom, and I will then read them out uh, uh, during the Q&A in Professor Dubois and uh, then um, reply to them and answer them. So, Thomas, if you are ready, then uh, close yours, you can start. Shall I uh, share a screen? Yes, please, yeah. Okay, let's see. How is that? Are we, are we sharing? That looks good to me, yeah. Okay, let me just put that back up. Okay. Um, Thank you very much for this very kind invitation. Time is short, so I'll keep that to a minimum. Today, we're going to talk about milk. And by talk about milk, I mean we're going to talk about milk powder and specifically the people who make it, uh, the, the company, the enterprise that makes milk powder in China. And one in particular that we're going to look at is called the Dengchuan Milk Powder Factory. It's known by a number of names, and we'll explain that as the talk goes on, uh, but this is the name that we're going to use because it's the one that continues throughout its 60-year history. And 60 years is, a, of course, a long time to look at one single enterprise, so we're going to see a lot of change. Uh, this enterprise came from very humble beginnings. It was founded in 1959 in the southwest city of Dali, uh, which anybody who has been to Dali will understand why I wanted to do a research project in Dali. That is a picture that uh, was just across the street from the hotel that I stayed at. So it's a, it, it's a lovely place. Um, it is also a place that is known for this iconic brand, the um, Dengchuan Milk Powder Company or the Dechuan, which is the name of the, uh, the butterfly spring, which is the name of the product that they make. Um, the company has 60 years of history and crosses a number of significant boundaries in China's business history. Uh, going from 1959 up to the present, it, at a most basic level, it goes from a one room factory, very humble, single uh, building inst uh, uh, production chain, uh, um, up to uh, probably the largest producer of dairy products in Southwest China with a significant overseas market. In 2013, its total output was over 600 million yuan. Uh, I'm going to keep numbers, by the way, to a minimum because there is a published article that is already out. You can read this. Uh, the DOI is gonna be available on the final slide. So uh, by all means, I encourage you to read that if you want the details. So this is just gonna be a quick run through some of the big ideas, um, again, which is kind of what you need to do when you're looking at at 60 years of history. In those 60 years, the company has gotten bigger, obviously. It's gotten technically much more uh, advanced. Its market has grown. Its product line has expanded beyond milk powder into all sorts of dairy products at all sorts of value added gates. And uh, in terms of China's specific business history, the company has transformed not just its name, but its ownership, its uh, relation to markets, and its relation to government. So it's privatized, it's marketized, and it has been eventually bought. It was purchased in 2003 by uh, the uh, 
uh, Sichuan-based consortium, New Hope, Xin Xi Wang. So as we go through these 60 years, we're going to see phenomenal change in this single company. Uh, so what we need to do first is we need to find a thread. And I'm going to point out, I'm going to highlight two specific questions that guided me through this project that uh, will, will remain constant through this 60 year period. The first is how the company interacts with its partners. Who are its partners? And what is the value that the company and the partners gain from this relationship? Now, I raise this because I started with the entirely uh, predictable, but in the end, inappropriate question of privatization. Uh, looking at a state-owned company, which is how it started, to a company that would eventually become a private subsidiary, the narrative that is most natural for us to deal with is privatization, marketization. Uh, that narrative is there, but it leads to a simple question of, is it a business or is it a, 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 an SOE? Is it a state-owned enterprise? And I think it's much more complicated than that. Uh, to better understand the idea of partnerships and how this particular enterprise would deal with its various partners, uh, I looked at the literature on business groups. And in business history, we would be looking at things like Keiretsu, the Japanese model, or Chebol in, in Korea. And, and a lot of people were looking for a Chinese model of business groups. Um, there is no model of business groups because a business group can be any sort of business alliance. It can be long or short term, it can be formal or informal, and it can be any uh, anything that, at, that two, two partners can give to each other. So what are some of the possibilities of uh, the possible ties in a business partnership? Uh, you could have asset ownership, you could have uh, resources, one part. Party B has resources that party A needs, uh, market access, uh, brand, finance, or technology. And uh, within this bigger picture, the local government, when I say government, I'm primarily talking about uh, the local government, the government of Dali, Chu, uh, of Dali Prefecture, rather than the national government. The government is one of the partners of the Deng Chuan Milk Company. Uh, for a long time, it's the primary partner of the Deng Tran Milk Company, which means that both sides are getting something out of this. So uh, the question, what and how does that change? That's going to be the first thread. This is important in particular because of dairy. Uh, this is, I'm gonna show you two slides. Um, dairy is a very complex industry. Uh, this is Meng Niu. Uh, this is asynchronic. So some of these ties don't exist, but these are the ties that uh, Meng Niu has to different actors, including uh, Kafka, Zhongliang, uh, but also Arla, Danan. Uh, they trade technology, they trade market access, they trade, uh, again, finance. Here's another one, um, Guangming in Shanghai. This is a very complicated industry. This is, again, something that is a little bit misleading when you think about dairy. It's only going to be a question of getting, of making the milk and getting it to market. It's actually far more complicated than that. That was the first thread. The second thread is how does the industry work? And within this, there are two, uh, two focuses. One is the milk base and one is the milk market. The milk base means the production of the milk, of the raw milk. This is not what Dong Chuan does or did at any point in its history. Actually, now it does. Um, giveaway, I told you the end of the story. Um, the, the milk base are the people who own the cattle, who run the cattle farms, run the dairy farms, and supply raw milk to the producer. That's what Dong Chuan is. Dong Chuan is, a producer, is a, a producer of milk powder. They're a processor. So that relationship between Dong Chuan and the milk base, between the processor and the producer, changes. The other part is the milk market. Who is buying it? In what form? Uh, how much are they spending? How is it getting to market? That's the second thread. So the first thread is the relationship to the partners. The second thread is where it sits in the larger industrial chain. So very quickly, I'll run through the three periods of history of Deng Chuan. 
Uh, the first one is the founding of the factory. And here is that fateful day. Where where did Dung Truong come from? It came from the early 1950s when there was a movement to uh, produce local industry outside of agriculture. And cadres would go around to different parts of the country and they would say, what can we do here to build the local economy? So in places like Gansu, in places like Inner Mongolia, uh, this meant building livestock industries, beef and uh uh, sheep meat in particular, wool industries, things that you can do in a pasture that you can't do as well in uh, an agrarian heartland. In 1954, the vice head of the National Veterinary Association went to Dali and noticed that this place has a history of producing dairy products uh, for Rubing or Rushan, which if you've been to Yunnan, this, this is one of the tourist products that everybody would take back. Um, they had a local cattle breed that was very good for making milk. And uh, he recommended that they build this industry with the help of the government. So they built a condensary to uh, sort of as a pilot product uh, project. And when that took off, they got funding, they got support to build a milk powder factory. And the reason you have to build a factory is that of course, Yunnan in the 1950s is kind of the picture of remote. You can't do any, you can't get a fresh product to a market. So you have to process it if you're going to build a market for it, if you're gonna build an industry out of it. Um, they built, they started work on the factory in 1958. It completed in 1959. That's the picture we see here. And there was a great deal of support from the government for this enterprise. Uh, the Yunnan provincial government put up the funds, 600,000 yuan, uh, but also Shanghai, various departments, contributed either uh, with training or with materials. So for example, the power plant was donated from Shanghai. Uh, uh, people who were going to be running the factory went to Shanghai to train, to use the material, to use the machines. Um, nevertheless, with all this support, they still had a lot of problems getting off the ground. Um, one of them was political. Uh, this became particularly pronounced in the 1960s that political uh, uh, activities sort of took over everything. Uh, and I based a lot of this on uh, interviews that I did with older workers from the plant. And they said during the late 1960s, early 1970s, one of the problems that they had is all the workers would take off, especially the young ones. They would go off to um, uh, to, to, to make revolution. Um, this was actually not a big problem because the big er problem was the problem they had with their milk base. So you could see, this is a picture here of the early machinery. This is a very low tech operation. This is literally hand cranking uh, milk sprayer. The bigger problem that they had was with their milk base. Uh, they are a processor of milk, which means they need to have a steady supply of raw milk coming into the factory and that they couldn't get. So this is a picture of where they are, you can see that the little line at the bottom is 20 kilometers. They're out in the middle of the mountains and they're collecting milk from farmers and then later from cooperatives that are spread out geographically along a very uh, large geographic area with very poor transportation infrastructure. They were getting their milk drawn, uh, brought in from horse carts. So by the time it got to the factory, half of it was spoiled. Um, e even after the transportation infrastructure was a little bit better. The problem was that farmers were not producing, that the, the dairy farmers were not producing enough milk to, uh, to, to keep the factory running. And so in 1976, there was a meeting of the, uh, the entire factory asking what, you know, how can we improve our, our operations? And the big question that came up was, how can we better incentivize the farmers to make more milk, to deliver more milk to the factory? And of course, the answer came in uh, 1978 with the market reforms. Now the market reforms for livestock industries were very similar to the ones in agriculture. They meant that uh, the farmers would eventually get control over the means of production, meaning the cattle, they would own the cattle and that they would be uh, paid a higher price. So you raise the price of purchase. This immediately meant that more milk was coming into the factory when you better incentivize the farmers. So you could see 
1981, there were 18 tons a day. In 1983, there were 36 tons a day. Now we've got the opposite problem. Instead of too little milk coming into the factory, now we have too much. So we have to upgrade. Now the ball goes back to the factory, to the processor. We have to start upgrading our, uh, our plant. We have to start investing in our plant. And we still haven't gotten to the second, even though the, the slide says we're in the second period, we haven't gotten there yet. That comes in 1985. Uh, in the early 1980s, they applied, Dung Tuan applied uh, to have some of their profits returned to the factory so that they could upgrade their equipment to better deal with the amount of milk that was coming in. The real change came in 1985 when they were allowed to take on debt to do so. So it wasn't just a matter of applying to the Yunnan provincial government to give us some of the profits back. Now uh, the enterprise was increasingly moving to be a freestanding operation in terms of its own profit and loss. This anticipates the 1990s. And during the 1980s, again, 85 was the dividing point, they could take on debt on their own uh, uh, on their own initiative. And they put that into building productive capacity. Uh, so in, 1980s, in 1981, it was a small investment, 800,000 yuan, 1986, a much bigger one, 2.2 million. The big one was 1989. And that was when they made the, the plant that you see in the bottom picture. That was a 20 million yuan, or actually even better, 3.03 .3 million US dollars because it was foreign currency denominated they bought a Dutch production line, top of the line, very high capacity. And this was a big deal in terms of how much money they were investing. They had to get permission from the Yunnan provincial government to do it, even though the debt was on the company itself. Now, this move into taking on productive debt is what pushed them into, in order to increase production, is what pushed them into the second period, which is when they become what's called a dragon head, uh, a dragon head industry. A dragon head industry is a, a concept that comes, it, you hear it a lot during the 1990s beginning. Uh, that is uh, an industry that is meant to be the sort of the engine that pulls along a local productive sector. So all of the other uh, producers in this industry are going to emulate this dragon head. The dragon head is what's going to forge the way. Uh, it was called fists in some of the early, uh, early documents that I saw. And during the 1990s, the, uh, the enterprise, Deng Chuan Milk Powder, was increasingly promoted by the Dali government, uh, less so by the Yunnan government, in particular by the Dali government, as an engine of local economic growth, in particular an engine of the local dairy industry, which had never been a particularly big concern. The, the big concern was tobacco. Um, but because the company was doing so well, dairy as an industry also rose in the estimation of local economic planners. So how did the government produce uh, promote the company in a few different ways? One, they promoted the milk base. Now again, remember that Dung Chuan all they do is they take raw milk and they turn it into milk powder, which is a marketable product. The milk is made at the milk base. And that is, a, again, it's a very complex industry with a lot of separate inputs. Uh, you have veterinary care. You have, in particular, I think the probably the most expensive and the, the really big difference is the breeding of the animals. Because if you have high quality milk animals, uh, in particular, um, the Holstein cattle, which are expensive and kind of temperamental as animals, um, your industry runs a lot more productively and efficiently, and you can make more of a profit as a farmer. Um, you can't do it with normal cattle. Uh, so breeding cattle, veterinary stations, infrastructure, research into feed, uh, uh, feed production. All of these things are invested in by the local government in a way that benefits Deng Chuan as a producer, as a processor. And you can see this with the size of the cattle herd. Uh, 1978, 7,500 head. By 1998, 
almost a 10, you know, about an eightfold increase, uh, 60,000 head. And they're not just more cattle, they're better quality and they're producing more milk per animal. The second way that the government promoted the industry was through markets. How did they get their product to market? And in particular, by finding foreign markets for Dungtran milk powder. Uh, until the early 1990s, Dungtran milk powder was sold. It, it, it was available nationwide, but it was primarily uh, locally consumed. In 1992, the first Dungtran milk powder was, it was first sold overseas and it was sold to Vietnam. Uh, by 1995, overwhelmingly, Dung Chuan milk powder was being sold to Southeast Asia, not to consumers in China. Uh, 1995, about 80% of the entire production, and remember that production is increasing significantly throughout the 1990s, is being sold to Burma. So I tried really hard to find a, a bag of milk powder with Burmese writing on it, couldn't find it. Why? Because after the Southeast Asian crisis, the market went back into China uh, because Southeast Asia stopped buying, um, among other things, they stopped buying uh, foreign milk powder, or at least that brand of foreign milk powder. Um, but what this shows is that the local government is promoting the Deng Chuan brand, the Deng Chuan industry, as a way of building the local milk sector, the local dairy sector. Uh, so that's the first thing to point out, government promotion, um, how it is behind the growth of the industry. And the, the, the people you see here, this is uh, Lo Guo Bin looking as 1980s as possible in his giant uh, suit. Um, he is one of the big uh, uh, one of the one of the big creative forces. He was the he became in the early 1990s the head of the factory, and he was very aggressive at building the factory. One of the big proponents. He was he was the vice head at the time they made the Dutch purchase. Um, and by the way, they paid off that 3.03 million dollar debt uh, way ahead of schedule. They borrowed it partially from the Dutch government, partially from the Yunnan government. Um, they were able to pay it off way ahead of schedule because of access to these Southeast Asian markets. Um, they also started expanding their product offerings. And we could talk more about the product offerings in a bit. Um, their, main, their main offering was still powdered milk, but they also started to produce things for industrial buyers like um, ice cream base. By the late 1990s, of course, Dong Tran was doing very well. This is when we, we start to have the... Uh, uh, the promise of enterprise reform. This is still a state-owned enterprise on the horizon. So we're going to eventually privatize this enterprise. Um, this is part of the, what is it, Dua Da Fang Xiao policy of only keeping the, uh, the strategic or the most important state enterprises under state ownership. Everything else would be uh, sent off to the private sector. Now, when you do this, you have a a local company, and this is increasingly really becoming the pride of the place. You've got Dali tobacco, you've got Dali beer, and you've got Deng Chuan milk powder. These are the three main products coming out of Deng Chuan, uh, coming out of Dali. Uh, and uh, the, the, the question is, if you're going to sell off this company, first of all, what's it worth? What's the value of this company? And second, who actually owns it? It's one thing to call it a state-owned enterprise, but the state is not a, a unitary entity. Over the late 1990s, this uh, uh, worked out to be a valuation of, I believe it was 60 million yuan. And it was, uh, it was devolved as a stock company. So it was renamed a stock, stock company uh, and 92%, I think it was, percent of the stock was then held by Aryan County. So that's the county uh, just to the north of Dali County. And that's where Deng Chuan is physically located. Um, so we've decided how much is it worth and who actually owns the stock. The remaining stock was held primarily by uh, former workers. And with this, we also have the problem when we evaluate the company, we also have the problem of debt. And there is a significant debt burden that goes along with the company that's going to be a problem in the future.
And the future is now because um, 19, it was 2000 that it was named. Uh, this is when we have uh, one of our first name changes. Uh, it was named the um, Aryan Yunnan Dongchuan Diechuan Naifen Chang Youxian Gongsi. So take out the Chang. Uh, so uh, I've, got, I've got the full name in the, in the last slide. Don't expect me to remember it. Um, but it becomes a stock company. And uh, this is seen as an intermediary step. There was always a plan to take this stock company and sell it to a private buyer. Now, why would they do this? The dairy industry itself was changing dramatically in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, you've got China joining the WTO, which means that you've got foreign competition. Um, dairy is taking off as a consumer product, which means that the whole enterprise is worth a lot more, but it's also becoming more complicated because milk powder is giving way to value added products like liquid milk and yogurt. These are the two big ones. But to make liquid milk and yogurt, requires more investment, it requires technical knowledge, and it requires investment to make new production lines. Um, quality and value added is now driving this much more valuable industry, which again has more foreign competition. So uh, they are now kind of out of their lead, they're out of their depth. And so as soon as the RUN government got the controlling stock in in the Dongchuan Milk Powder Company, um, they started looking for a buyer. And the natural buyer during the late 1990s, in particular the, the, the early 2000s, was Nestle. Why Nestle? Because Nestle was going around buying up. Now, Nestle has been in China since the late 1980s with their, their uh, production of, of um, coffee maker, coffee made in uh, Shuangcheng, way up in Heilongjiang. Uh, but in the early 2000s, late 1990s, they were going around buying up these small dairy companies uh, in order to build a national brand, in order to increase capacity to become a, a dairy product, the, the sort of the leading producer in China. Um, in the early 2000s, the, the local government and the factory management, these two together, came to Beijing um, very close to where I am, as a matter of fact, just, just down a couple of roads away. Um, got an offer and accepted the offer. The offer was um, for 40 million yuan, so below what the company was valued at, and it left the government with the pension debt. Now, this was a very bad deal, as a certain terrible president of ours would, would have said. Um, and when word got out, there were... Uh, not protests, but there was a letter writing campaign. And uh, in particular, former workers said that you are giving away one of our main assets. Uh, you're dramatically underestimating the value of this enterprise. This should absolutely not go through. And so they had already agreed to the deal, but the pressure was such that the deal was taken off the table. And um, the head of the, uh, not Luo Guobian, because he's already uh, moved on by this point, the head of the uh, company was sacked. So uh, it shows you how important these brands are to, uh, to, to locals. This is something that they had invested in in, in many ways. Um, the Nestle offer went off the table and they got a new offer in 2003 from Xin Xiwang, from New Hope, uh, which uh, again is from Sichuan. They started making feed and they be, they're now one of the biggest uh, uh, food and agriculture consortiums in the country. And they made an offer that was substantively, it wasn't just a higher uh, RMB figure, it wasn't just a high dollar, higher uh, cash figure. It was substantively different from the one that Nestle had offered. It came with conditions. Uh, for one thing, they offered more money, obviously. Uh, but more than that, the New Hope purchase of Deng Chuan was going was specifically set up with benchmarks that were going to invigorate the national the, the local dairy sector. So the benchmarks were one, you can't fire anybody. 95% of the existing workers have to be retained uh, for a, a period, I think it was three years. 
Um, two, we have investment benchmarks. You have to put in, uh, in different places, uh, you have to put in, um, what is it, 100, um, 120, yes, 100, one, one comma two oh oh oh. oh. Me forgot my numbers. Million, uh, one billion two hundred thousand, one billion two hundred million uh, yuan investment. Not all in one go, obviously, uh, but over time, that was the figure that it came to. And this was something called the Qian Dun Yonai, a uh, thousand tons of milk program. And uh, significantly, it would go into the factory, into upgrading capacity, but it would also go into the dairy base. And this is in Aryuan. County and to the north in Jiantran County. Um, so the, the company's investment is now taking over a little bit of the capacity of, of building the dairy base that the local government was doing before. The third thing they had to do was to give benchmarks for increasing production. And if you're going to be investing this much in the factory and the milk base, obviously production is going to go up as well. And the benchmarks were 2004, we have to do 100 kilotons per year, 2008, 300 kilotons per year. And as it turns out, the market was so booming that uh, they far exceeded both the investment and the production benchmarks, purely as a market-driven response. Um, and I'll, I'll finish this up very quickly. Uh, things were going very well until 2008. That's when you had the San Lu milk poisoning incident. And what that did was transform the the uh, milk industry, the dairy industry nationally um, through uh, consumer preference, but primarily, particularly in the early days, 2008, 2000, or 2009, 2010, through um, uh, new uh, uh, legal measures, government measures um, to join, to, uh, the, the reason there had been poisoning is that the, the processors and the milk producers were separate entities with separate interests. So in between, you have a lot of room for shenanigans. And this is where, where the milk poisoning came in. So the, the government initiative is to link this whole thing up in one line, which means that the processor now is taking over production and investment in the milk base. And the milk base is no longer uh, separate households with three or four head of cattle. Now it's a large investment heavy, capital heavy, technology heavy dairy farm with a few hundred or in, in places like Inner Mongolia, a few thousand head of cattle. Um, this is again, another opportunity for the, um, for the partnership to evolve. So what is the government getting? What are the investors getting? And what is the processor doing in the middle? Um, so what we see just very quickly, I'll, I'll show you these, uh, big picture uh, images of the industry. The line on the left is the number of cattle. That's the size of the cattle herd. And the uh, solid graph or the solid shape on the right is the amount of milk production. You could see that when it takes off, it really takes off under these, um, these uh, as, as new entities, um, particularly after purchase by Xin Ximang, by New Hope. So you put this up against the benchmarks and you can see there's a very clear correlation between these changes in policy, changes in, in investment and the size of the industry. So just to close out, um, I had two threads that I wanted to bring out. One was uh, how does Deng Tran deal with its partners? And two, how does the industry work? And they're really two sides of the same question. Um, Deng Tron was built in order to lead the sector. You have dairy production. It can't get to a market. We need a milk processor. That's why Dung Tron was created. And at every stage, particularly through its dragon head phase, it, but it was succeeding in order to promote the sector. Um, in terms of adapting to market requirements, this is the second half of the story. This is when milk production becomes very capital and technology intensive. And this is when the, the partnership really uh, moves to the private sector that can bring this to Dung Tran. But 
Dungtron is still tasked, and now the private sector partners are tasked with this initial, this uh, original uh, job, which never goes away, of developing Dungtron locally. So privatization, in this sense, it 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 does happen, but it's not a a moment. It's a process, and it's a transformative process that is not just state owned, private owned. The state never goes away and private initiative never goes away throughout the entire process. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't go too far over my time. No, no, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for that very interesting talk. I think uh, really quite the tour de force of the, uh, of the dairy industry. I certainly learned um, a lot. Um, so as I said, please, uh, we now have uh, some time for Q&A. So please uh, post any questions that you might have in the Q&A box. And, um, uh, I'll then read them out for uh, Professor Dubois. I should also mention that I posted the DOI of the uh, article in the chat box. So if you want to have a look at that, you can do that uh, there. Um, I think uh, we have the oh, we have a first question from uh, Brian Demar, um, who says, a "Wonderful talk. I'm curious to hear about the sources uh, Dr. Dubois found for his research." Okay, very good question. Uh, yeah. Hello, Brian. Um, I, I got into um, this topic because of a very good friend uh, who uh, is from this area, and he had family who were sort of mid-level management in the factory in the 1980s. So I started interviewing them before I knew anything else because they were very old, and it's one of these things that you know you 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 have a chance to talk to somebody you you just ask any question you can they got me uh so one source was interviews and i did those at the very beginning at the very end when i didn't know what i was doing and when i kind of knew the story in between there were two main sources one is a uh changzhi a gazetteer a history of the um of the factory that was produced in 1990 so that whole earlier period is really well described. And in particular, what, what is good about that source is it has all their financials. And it's not something we associate with the socialist period that they're going to be keeping detailed numbers. But of course they were. Uh, so we see their operating capital. We see their rotating capital. We see their profit, loss, all of these things recorded very clearly. You also see their response to things like the 1960s from the perspective of 1990. So they would look at this time when they weren't able to get any, any milk in. And uh, you know they said, what did we do? We did what we could. We couldn't get milk. So we made um, uh, uh which is kind of like Ovaltine. Uh, you know, it's, it's a wheat milk. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a dry uh, um, sort of a milk substitute essentially. Uh, you know, we had the productive capacity, we didn't have anything coming in. You know, we made, uh, we made candied fruit because, you know, what else are we going to do? Um, that I thought was very interesting because it's a historical source from the 1990s. The third source that I got was um, Nian Jian, uh, yearbooks. And those were uh, very useful because they showed county by county or in some cases uh, below a county. Uh, so there was one from Aryuan Zhen, um, really showing the, the 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 dairy industry developing year by year, and that was very important for seeing um, uh, where, it, in particular, where they would fit into plans, uh, uh, you know, five year plans and whatnot. This starts to appear around 1990. Um, that the, uh, the 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 higher amount, the greater amount of political focus on the industry and on the factory in particular. Right, great. Um, we do have another question from Alice Xu. Um, she says, thanks for the great talk. Uh, from your talk and your article, it seems that the state involvement always remains. But were there times when the state interests and the enterprise interests are not aligned? And what happened then? That's a very good question. Because, uh, and that connects nicely to the, you know, to the sources, because eventually the sources are all state sources. Um, so if you look in the uh, things like the, the yearbooks, nobody is going to talk about the Nestle debacle. 
because it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing for everybody. So it's never mentioned. And I only learned about this when I presented this paper in Beijing. And there happened to be somebody there who knew this story. It's like, why, you know, why haven't you talked about the Nestle thing? <laughs> What what Nestle thing? <laughs> and so I, I, you know, it was it. Then I could go and I look in the business press, and then I went back to Dali and I interviewed people, and they told me, oh yeah, you're you're kind of missing something important here. Um, I think that's probably the best example of a state um, uh, state enterprise mismatch, um, because it's hard to say who's really representing the enterprise. It's it's really a question of. Who, who the enterprise is representing uh, because it's still state owned, but you have people like uh, Logobi in the 1990s that are really pushing to make this uh, a profitable industry, even though there's, there's uh, you know, there's, there's no private ownership of the company itself. Um, so I would say that's, that's probably the most clear example of a mismatch of interests, I think more than a mismatch, because then you're, then with a mismatch, you're looking for a conflict. I think through much of the 1980s and 1990s, it's more of a sense that the two sides are just not talking to each other. You know, that there's kind of a fog between them rather than a, rather than a hard conflict. All right. Um... Another question from Anita Wang. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentation, Professor Dubois. Um, what's the final transaction price when you hope to take over the milk factory? And what was the main reason it was accepted by the government? Uh, the transaction price, uh, I'm gonna have to pull up the article because I don't remember the, the actual amount. It was more, um, uh, it was, I, I, I don't have it out. I don't want to be opening uh, files well because I'll because I'll close Zoom. That's what'll happen. <laughs> um, it was more than what Nestle offered. More importantly than the uh, higher price they offered was the fact that they were willing to take on the pensions and debt uh, that uh, that new Wang uh, that new uh, Xinji Wang that new Hope was was willing to do that, um, and that they were willing to. Uh, commit to benchmarks to grow the enterprise. That was really uh, what put it over the top. And I should also say that the, you know, the, the main reason it was accepted by the government, these benchmarks were set out by the government. So the government told New Hope, if you wanna buy this company, um, this is what you have to commit to. New Hope said yes. And in fact, since that time, they've gone far uh, in excess of the benchmarks because the, the dairy market has uh, developed so quickly. Um, in addition, one thing I, I didn't mention in the talk is since that time, there have been two other main competitors that came in that were both very large, very well capitalized, you know, in, in the, the, the size of hundreds of millions of yuan of output per year. Um, so, this capital intensive technology intensive industry is uh, is growing very quickly, not just the one uh, and not just Dongtuan itself, but uh, these two others. One is called Dongya, one is called Lesser. All right, thank you. Um, a rather long question from Jackie Armijo um, on Nestle. Um, so she says that uh, she recently returned to China and she has been surprised that Nestle is dominating the local water bottle sales in Shanghai. Um, and then she talks about uh, an, in, a baby formula controversy in the 1990s mm. where um, about apparently Nestle um, formula was given uh, uh, to newborn babies. And um, she wonders whether there is any, like, this involvement of Nestle had any long-term consequences, I guess, for the deal with uh, with the case you're talking about. The, the, this is uh, this actually this goes back to the 1970s. Uh, Nestle has been um, uh, taken to task, particularly for Africa and Latin America, selling milk products and milk powder as a substitute for breast milk, and the idea is that uh, they're selling a um, they're discouraging breastfeeding 
in order to sell their product, which is not nutritionally as good as breastfeeding. And um, uh, th this was, this was uh, a focus of anti-Nestle activism. Again, not just the 1990s, going back to the, to the 1980s and 1970s, and it was global. Um, I think, uh, let's see, let me just make sure I've got the question. It's formula for a full week insurance price feed. Um, I don't know that this has been a particular focus in China um, because there are so many other, you know, the question of breastfeeding versus formula feeding is a, a huge one in China. Um, there are so many formula producers that I think, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, and especially after, after not San Lu, before San Lu, there was in, in 2004, there was a, another crisis. People had been called the Fukang uh, uh, scandal. Uh, in Anhui, they were stripping protein out of milk powder to sell it separately and then selling the milk powder. And then people were feeding it to their babies who ended up being malnourished. So this is the, the, the earlier scandal before San Lu. I think there's been, there have been, a, through these scandals, there has been a great deal of scrutiny on the milk powder and in particular milk formula industries. Uh, and again, scrutiny is not just from the government, it's from the consumers. And this is what's really, really new uh, since you know, the, the internet really took off in the mid 2000s. Um, there are thousands of discussion sites and WeChat sites and whatnot where people talk about um, uh, any kind of production scandals, any kind of production rumors, which product is better for my baby, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't think this could really happen again without maybe significant government interference to shut these down. Um, so Nestle does have a, a very, actually a very good name in China. I think if people uh, have a problem with Nestle as a company, it would be more the fact that it's a foreign company and they would rather support a domestic one. Okay. So that's, that's a long answer. It's a, uh, sure. a little bit unfocused. <laughs> yeah. uh, the question though is just keep on coming in. Next uh, question is from Hersi. Um, it says, thanks for the talk. Um, your story is from the 1950s. Uh, as we know, Dongchuan is an ethnic region of the five groups. And there's a very long history of making Rushan, which I think is a kind of cheese. If I'm mm -hmm. not. Yeah. So after building of the factory, of the factory, was there kind of an influence of this older tradition? That's the question. Uh, Rushan is really interesting stuff. And I've spent a lot of time in, in Rushan factories uh, in Dali. Um, thank, thank you, Hoshi, by the way. Um, uh, Rushan, if you would go to Yunnan in the, uh, say, the, the, the 90s or, you know, or before, you were kind of required to come back with some of these, I think they're called the, the Yunnan Si Guai or Ba Guai, uh, these, these local products. Uh, one was uh, um, rose petal moon cakes. Um, or, you know, these kind of things. But the big one, if you went to Yunnan, you had to try Rushan. And Rushan is, uh, it's just sheets of fresh cheese that are dried and then you roast them and you could serve them with um, condensed milk. There's also uh, Rubing, which is kind of like a uh, uh, mozzarella, a fresh mozzarella cheese. And um, what's interesting is before you had to go to Yunnan and bring it back because it was rare because it was scarce, because it was Yunnan. Now I can go online, if I knew where my phone was, I could go online and order it um, and it would be delivered to my house. And the people who make it in Yunnan have developed, and this is, this is you know, similar to Feiyi, it's similar to uh, intangible cultural heritage, something that develops fame as a local product since, the past 10 years, they have now developed marketing channels to deliver these things nationally and in some cases internationally, not for food products though. And so that has changed the way that they're produced. Now what would be handicraft, a handcraft production, now they have to make them at scale because now they're, they're making 10, 20, 50 times as much. My friend who makes uh, Rushan in Dali 
Um, they used to do say, you know, one or two tons of milk per day. Now they're doing 30 or 40 because the majority of their sales are now online, direct sales uh, that are delivered by Jingdong. Um, so I think that has really more than, and, and this is entirely separate from Deng Chuan. This is entirely separate from the development of a non-ethnic dairy industry. This is something that's specifically selling a, a, a place and an ethnic flavor. Uh, so these two tracks uh, are, are both developing very quickly, but they're, they're entirely separate from each other. Interesting, okay. Um, the next question is uh, from Louise Edwards and it's about the international connection of, of, uh, uh, of the Chinese dairy industry. Hmm. Um, but she basically asks, are there other examples you can tell us about uh, the international connections of the Chinese dairy industry as it evolved hmm. over these decades? I'm particularly interested in the possibility that it impacted the way people in formerly, quote unquote, remote areas think about their hometowns in relation to, quote unquote, the international. I can see that they had new views about their connection to regional and national, but uh, what was, what was sort of the local to international connection uh, vis a vis Myanmar and Southeast Asia? Hmm. But also beyond. That, that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, and thank you, Louise. Um, uh, the, the main center, Particularly, we have the main dividing point 2008, before and after Sanlu. Um, before 2008, you had a lot of local dairy industries, maybe along the size, uh, along the scale of Deng Chuan. Uh, basically, every province had one. Um, after 2008, there's a national push to consolidate these. Again, consolidation and scale. These are the two big things that come out of 2008 in the interest of safety, but also in the interest of efficiency. Um, and the whole thing moves up to Inner Mongolia and Heilongjiang, particularly Inner Mongolia. So now the whole industry is in a suburb uh, called Hlingar of, um, of, uh, of Hoha. And uh, that's something like, you know, 80% of national production is, is in that one place. The two big companies, Mengyong and Yili, are in this one small place. So this is, you know, it's meant to be China's dairy city. That's the name they're making for it. Um, so this process of consolidation also changes the relationship to the market, domestic and international. And one thing that WTO did is it brought in increased foreign um, uh, influence, in particular foreign capital. So Meng Yo, first you had Ili, and Meng Yo split off from Ili. How did Meng Yo split off from Ili and suddenly become a mega company? Uh, Merrill Lynch, I think it was Merrill Lynch, uh, invested in a new company. And it was something like $20 million, which you know seemed like a big number at the time. In today's industry, it's, it's nothing. Um, but And since then, they've gotten out of it. But you have increased uh, internationalization of these big brands because they're big. Now it's called the D20. They wanna have 20 big companies, but really it's, it's you know, four or five. Uh, Meng Yo Yili, Guangming, you know, the, um, San Yuan. Uh, but, but Meng Yo and Yili are the, the, the big two, which means that their, their production chains are international. Um, Yili has huge investments in New Zealand. Uh, they tried to make one in Australia and, and that one got shot down by the Foreign Investment Board. For an investment review board, um, uh, Feihe, a smaller one, has a, a huge plan. These are hundreds of millions of dollars in Canada. Um, so, what has it done in terms of connecting local to uh, uh, international um, in these particular areas? It has taken places that were, you know, kind of remote or extremely remote, and it has moved them firmly into the mainstream. So uh, it, it really has been a, a complete transformation of the, ge of the geography, economic, social, productive. Well, oh, great, no, that's very interesting. If I could maybe sort of uh, connect to that, I wanted to ask a bit more about the early history of this internationalization, because you do mention uh, Southeast Asia, obviously. And I was wondering what the reasoning was to um, go in, sort of in the early period of, of, of the dairy industry, but also the company you're talking about, 
to go to Southeast mm-hmm. Asia. Because my immediate connection was that in the Republican period, a lot of Chinese entrepreneurs go to Southeast Asia because the competition of foreign products in places like Shanghai and Tianjin is too intense. So they just sort of partner up with the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia and sell mm-hmm. their products there first. Um, I guess foreign competition will at that point have not have been that important, you know, but maybe are there local Chinese factories that are particularly doing well in Shanghai so that they, or in, in these kind of coastal areas, so that, that they decide to first expand to Southeast Asia? I just wondered that's, what the reasoning was yeah. behind that. That's a very good question, and I really don't know um, uh, why they put, how they particularly chose uh, Vietnam and then in particular Burma. I know that uh, Dung Tran was being sold, was being shipped overland from from Yunnan into Burma, mm-hmm. that it was showing up in, in Burmese markets before it officially was, was uh, promoted as an export. I don't think that if there was any competition, it wasn't coming from China because China's national milk production was still so low mm-hmm, sure. that they weren't uh, exporting anything. Um, and I think if, if anything, it was simply a matter that selling it overseas uh, was a source of foreign currency. I think that was the real, um, the, the real attraction is that you could earn more from the foreign market than you could domestically. And that all changed after the Southeast Asian economic crisis. Um, but the fact that they're going to Burma in particular s- suggests to me that um, they were going to a market that maybe international producers like, like Nestle uh, kind of, you know, that they were below their radar. Mm-hmm, sure, yeah. That, that's that's my suspicion. Mm-hmm. Sure. Do you know if they um, targeted specific demographies, you know, whether it's more for um, infant feeding or elderly? I, mean, I wonder if the if the target market had something to do with it because of the uh, demographic structures. They they didn't, and they still don't have. Well, now they do. They they make it under different names. Um, they they really never moved out of. They never moved into the. Uh, the formula space, um, particularly in this early period, uh, when they diversified, it was, you know, first first was uh, yogurt, then liquid milk. Uh, pardon me. First was liquid milk, then yogurt, um, shipped locally. Um, but in terms of value added, it was it was uh, products that were tasty rather than products, rather than getting into the formula space. So I don't think it was so much demographic driven as simply a matter of having the capacity to produce refrigerated product. Um, The next question comes from Chieko Nakajima. Um, And uh, she asked, as the company became bigger, I assume their market also expanded. How did the company attract consumers to purchase their products? What commercial promotion strategies did they use? That, that's a, a very good question. Um, I don't know much about the promotion strategies because so much of the dairy industry in China seems to be selling itself. Um, the, the market is has exploded so quickly that really in terms of promotion strategies, the only thing you need to do is, is, is be faster than your competitors uh, rather than winning people over to dairy consumption itself. And this is something that I've seen uh, uh, you know, in, in the long term. Um, during the 1980s, nationally, you know, we have this image that Chinese people never drank milk. Of course, John doesn't have this image. John, John knows better. <laughs> um, but yeah, Chinese people love milk and they always have. Um, the, the Shanghai dairies in the 1930s and 40s could never make enough product for the market. Um, in the 1980s, the early 1980s, one of the first crises that you had with, with um, Gaigo Kaifang food production um, was what they call the, um, the, the, the difficulty of the mainainan, the difficulty of buying milk. And people were lining up uh, because they now now it's not sold with coupons anymore. Now you just buy it. And so people are buying us uh, lining up at milk stations at two, three in the morning uh, because they want this stuff so bad. 
Um, and if they line up too late, they're going to run out. So uh, dairy has always been extremely attractive, far in excess of the ability to produce. Um, in this area in particular, because they have a history of consuming milk, not drinking it, they're eating it as, a, as this cheese, um, there, there was no need to court the market. Um, now where the, the, the market is, where, where you need to have promotions is to outcompete these other highly capitalized competitors. Uh, so one thing that is going on is, for example, new flavors of yogurt. Uh, this is where formula would come in saying, you know, we have this milk powder, not, not formula itself, but this milk powder that's specifically formulated for the elderly, for example. Um, these are trying to squeeze out a segment in a very crowded market. Um, water buffalo milk is uh, the third. There are these three big ones in, in Deng Tuan, the third uh, uh, called um, Lai Siar, uh, lesser, is, um, and again, they're doing it by growing, by raising their own water buffalo um, with the help of one of the county governments. Um, in order to compete with these two larger producers, they are producing a unique product, water buffalo yogurt, which is, which is delicious, by the way, I should add this. Um, it's much more creamy than, uh, than, than, uh, uh regular milk, you know, Huang uh, yogurt. Um, but that's, I think it's not a matter of getting people to the product now where the market is so big, it's a matter of surviving and bringing people to a unique product. Right. Um, the next question is from Deng Yanchu and, uh, I basically asked about whether the oral history interviews revealed anything about the workers themselves and whether generational shifts of the labor force had a bearing on, on the business history at large. I, I don't have it. It's a very good question. Thank you. Um, I don't really have a good answer because most of the interviews I did were focused on the 1980s and 90s. Um, where... Uh, you know, where you wouldn't see generational change. What I really saw from this period though, uh, was intense loyalty to the enterprise. Whereas I don't think that would be the case as in, in the same way now. Um, the people who came up during the eighties and nineties really saw this as a, you know, as a, as a, a personal, you know, a labor of love. And that's why they were so upset that the, the local government was willing to sell it cheap to a foreign buyer. It wasn't just a matter of the pensions. It wasn't just a matter of the company. They were personally incensed at this. So I, I think that is one generational change. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly because an effect of globalization. We don't only see in China, but more, more generally, right? So when the when international investment comes in. Um, Anita Wong has another question about, uh, well, more the research side. So, whether you did you get any access to the uh, Deng Chuan uh, Difang Center and what kind of whether there was any support from the local government for your research? Um, I didn't use the Xian Zhi because I used the Nian Jian. And generally, these are produced by the same people. And so, the Nian Jian would have the same information in a, in a great deal more detail. Uh, one other source. That I, that I didn't mention uh, was that I had uh, documents from the five-year plans. So I could see, um, you know, 1990, uh, where, you know, where, where the industry fit in. Um, these were all from the Deng Chuan Library. As a matter of fact, I didn't go to the archives for these. Um, and the Deng Chuan Library, you know, had these. They, they uh, were extremely uh, helpful for getting me these materials. Um, so beyond that, I didn't really work with the local government because in this case, I didn't need to. I will for future work because what I'm going to be doing in the future is I'm moving away from the dairy industry to the beef industry. And just like the dairy industry, this is a complicated production line that involves a great deal of local government support. And even in Dung Chuan, there are certain counties that are you know, fr from the plan uh, uh, Jian Chuan County, 
and uh, Aryan County are dairy counties. Weishan County, just to the south, is, is a beef county. And this is a different kind of cattle. They're eating different things. They have different, uh, obviously, uh, uh, different distribution systems. Um, so uh, it, I didn't need to work with the local government for this product, for this project, because there was so much material available. Um, I think I will for future product projects. Um, Lingma asks, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Dubois. I'm curious how New Hope and other capital intensive enterprises have changed uh, the landscape of milk production in the local. Are the farmers still raising cattle in the old way? This is a very good question. And, and I really like these questions because these are things that I couldn't get to in the talk. Uh, the quick answer, nope, nope, completely no. There's been a radical transformation in terms of how cattle are raised. Um, this is primarily 2008. Um, before 2008, cattle were still raised. If you go back to the 19, uh, late 1970s, uh, they were held in communes. So cattle, all livestock were communally raised, communally owned. So the commune would get certain bonuses for increasing the number of animals. Then the animals were returned to the farmers, returned to the household. And that is how it stayed until basically about 2000, you know, the mid 2000s. Um, even in the mid 2000s, even as uh, processing, and this is throughout the country, processing becomes very capital intensive. Processing uh, takes on scale. Production overwhelmingly is still one household, two or three head of cattle. That's, that's literally the scale we're talking about. Mm -hmm. 2008 changed that because that's when they start to incentivize local governments to incentivize scale production of animals. So you would get tax breaks for having uh, over 10 head, more tax breaks for having over 50 head, more tax breaks for having over 100 head. This is one of the questions that I would always ask when I would go out to the farms is, okay, you've got 30 head of cattle here. Why 30? Why not 50? Why not 10? Why is this the number that works for you? And I didn't know this question was important until I asked it over and over and over. Um, this is also why the cattle bases have to physically move away from Dali because of um, pollution. You can't have cattle close to a tourist area. So they move physically away. This is why the industry as a whole moves up to Inner Mongolia because you can have a thousand head of cattle, you can't have a thousand head of cattle in Yunnan. You have to feed them. Uh, you know, you have to provide them water. Probably the hardest part about raising cattle at scale isn't the food, it's the water. You have to have water resources. These are, you know, this means that it has to be done in a, in a particular way, in a particular place. So um, this is also why companies like Xinxiwang or Dongya have to be very, uh, willing to invest high, high amounts of capital because now they are the ones who are tasked with transforming the milk base from household by household production to large scale uh, dairy farm production. So it's it's been a radical transformation. Yeah, um, we find another question um, about the whole Shanghai connection. So. The question is basically asking in the 1950s, obviously you mentioned that um, the dairy companies sent uh, people to Shanghai for training. And I think you also mentioned that the machinery was brought over uh, from Shanghai. So um, um, so the question is whether apart from uh, this technological help, whether there was any assistance from Shanghai. Hello, Xi'an. Um, this is a very good question. Uh, yes, um, the power plant, Came from, uh, came from Shanghai. Um, I think one of the things that I didn't mention uh, is the cattle themselves. Um, a Holstein cow can produce four to six times as much milk as a, a, an ordinary yellow cow, uh, ordinary Huangmiao, uh, but they eat the same amount of feed. So if you're gonna run a dairy industry, 
you've got to have high quality, specialized animals. And this is one of the big investments that the government made going back you know, th from, from the very beginning is they produced a local breed of cattle called Deng Chuan Har Tai, or Har, uh, what is it, Holstein? Har, har si tai, I think it is. Um, uh, but it's a Deng Chuan version. So it breeds with the Deng Chuan cattle and it produces a uh, specialized dairy breed that is particularly suited to, you know, to the Shui Tu of this place, to the, to the altitude, because we're, we're very high up in the air in, in Dali, uh, to the local feed, to the local water conditions. This is done at, at dairy industries nationwide. Uh, you're not just bringing in Holstein cattle, you're, you're making specialized Holsteins with specialized uh, feed mixes to work in that particular place. And Shanghai was the source of the cattle. I have a feeling that they were also the source of a great deal of the technical knowledge that went into the breeding because this, this is by far the largest investment that's made in the milk base is changing the, uh, the animals. Right. Um, if I could just like connect to that is, because I was, I was also very interested in this whole Shanghai connection. Is this kind of technology transfer something you, I mean, do we, is that like something that generally happens in the 1950s that sort of Shanghai exports its technological powers to other parts of China? I think normally we sort of think about Shanghai in the sort of 50s and 60s, it was sort of a bit of a, you know, it's sort of a shadow of its former self and so on. But this yeah. aspect is something I haven't heard of, this kind of spreading the technological advantage that they have before towards uh, the rest of China. So I wonder whether you know of any other cases. Um, I don't know of other cases in particular. I would, I would suspect anything connected with light industry would be very disproportionate disproportionately influenced by Shanghai mm -hmm. uh, technology transfer. In livestock industries, um, Ch Shanghai and the Shanghai area, the Jiangnan area, were overwhelmingly the, the masters of dairy production in the 1930s and 40s. Um, they had the, the physical assets of the specialized cattle, but they also had the knowledge of, um, of producing the milk, but also say uh, producing uh, uh, condensing this kind of thing. So dairy could only come from Shanghai. Uh, other aspects of the livestock industry, there were, um, for example, slaughtering. Uh, animal slaughter, because the animals that were being slaughtered for overseas production, um, beef and lamb in particular, they were going primarily to the Middle East or disproportionately to the Middle East in the 1950s and 60s. So you have to slaughter them halal. Oh, and where do you get the knowledge of how to slaughter animals halal, Ningxia? Mm -hmm. So what happens in the early 1950s, you have a, a, a mass exodus of slaughterers going from Ningxia to, they go to Gansu, they go to Heilongjiang, uh, they go Anywhere in the country that's producing beef and lamb for overseas production, now you have this specialized technical knowledge, which is a very different kind of technical knowledge than, you know, than, than, than making uh, industrial parts, um, but, you know, being spread. So it's not Shanghai based as, as well. The people from Deng Chuan, you know, they went to Shanghai to learn. They also became part of a network. So they went to Anda in Heilongjiang which is you know, where, where the milk that goes to Harbin comes from. Uh, there was a big uh, dairy industry convention up there in, in, the, in the 1960s. Uh, I know they went to, um, I think there was another one in Wuxi. Um, so any place that was producing milk, the national brain trust, the national industry would convene there for a, a big uh, convention. So I think it's, in many ways, it starts from Shanghai, but the real story, I think, is the, the circulation of knowledge, mm -hmm. how it gets sped up during the 50s and 60s. Well, super interesting. Yeah, that's great. Um, can I jump in? 
Oh, please do. Yeah. Uh, Thomas, this is obviously a fascinating project, not just uh, because you get to go to Dali. As a business historian, you 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 look at the sources you're talking about, the financials, the business strategy strategies, and everything. I mean, that's paradise to us. Uh, my question is, um, because of my naivete and ignorance, I didn't expect Dali to be the Wall Street of China. But then the deals <laughs> that you're talking about, I mean, these people don't need to go to business school to understand how to structure a deal. Mm. Um, perhaps connected to the international um, uh, questions or the Shanghai questions, how do you see this uh, diffusion of financial knowledge uh, from this site? You know, who, who is actually introducing such um, ideas to them that you need to have benchmark and you need to figure out the debt ratio, um, the burden, what is optimal? How, how, do you, how do you assess the situation? I don't think that, that that's a very good question. I, I would love to learn more about the the Kuai Qi, who 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 actually ran the business, um, I have no idea, uh, because of course these people are you know they're no longer uh, with us. Um, the actual accounting, from from what I could understand, you know it's it's the same kind of accounting figures that you would see in a, a defuncture for example, in a, in a local gazetteer. And it's primarily just a profit and loss kind of setup. Um, you know, th there are lots of numbers, but you don't know how the numbers are being used uh, or what they mean. Uh, you know, so we, we have a, a, a figure for how much tax is being remitted to the government. We have a figure for total production. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the, the, the numbers that I saw from the 60s and 70s. Um, we have a total total amount that they spent on materials, which was primarily milk, but also things like packaging. Um, in terms of debt, they didn't have a really strong sense of it because again, before 1985, it wasn't their debt. Um, I, would, I would love to know a, more detail about how they, because they did seem to understand this just very quickly. Um, how they change their thinking to become a profit oriented, even though they were still state owned, a, a, an aggressively profit oriented business. Um, the big question mark for me is the man in the beautiful suit, uh, Luo Guobin, because I couldn't find much about him. And he seems to have been the leading driving figure um, and I, I couldn't find much about him. Even in interviews, people just said, yeah, he was a nice guy, but, but nobody could tell me more. Uh, so I think he would be the one who would, who, who would be the key to understanding how this particular business became so savvy so quick. But unfortunately, I don't have an answer. Yeah, this is, a, <clears throat> this is an interesting side of the story in, in addition to all the uh, dairy accounts or whatnot. I mean, you you basically, it seems to me that you basically have um, the old technocrats meeting with the free market. Mm -hmm. the technocrats actually did know the accounting. So we just don't know how they did the accounting. Right, right. Thank you. It's lovely. Well, I mean, the real question is when they would, when they would invest in value. I mean, for, for me, this is really going to be the big question. This is why I'm interested in beef. Because you know, with with milk or with beef, you've got the you've you've got the same question. I've got a raw product, literally a raw product. Why would I invest in it? How would I invest in it? How would I turn this raw? How would I turn raw beef into canned beef? You know, what? Where is the 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 mental change that that produces this? And where is the capital coming from? And who do you have to convince? And how do you turn, you know, a local asset into an industry? So I think that that really is the, you know, in addition to anything else, it's also a mental leap that has to be made. Yeah. Do we have any any final questions? That uh, moment. Huh? I think otherwise, I'd. Uh... Like to thank again, uh, Professor Dubois, for this wonderful talk. I think clearly you know, the, the many questions and the attendees show that you know how much interest there is, and we're surely all very eager to learn more about the uh, 
a new project on beef now. Um, and uh, I think it's a, it's a really um, fantastic case study, both in terms of the time period that you look at, but also getting us back. I mean, so much of China's business history is basically Shanghai and a few of the mm -hmm. coastal cities. So learning something about Yunnan is certainly very interesting. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Before we close, I should mention that um, uh, the next uh, Chinese business history webinar will take place uh, on the 26th of February. Um, when we will have uh, Professor Philip Tai from Northeastern University, um, who will talk to us um, about his new research project on um, Hong Kong's role within the uh, Anglo-American war on, on the drug trade in the 1970s. So that um, sort of uh, promises to be a very exciting talk as well. We will, of course, be um, advertising that talk as usual uh, through our email list and uh, through our website and social media. So. Um, um, then you can uh, register uh, for that. And I hope to see many of you there. Um, and uh, thanks again for everyone uh, for tuning in to this talk. And once more, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Thomas, for, for this wonderful talk, for taking the time to present your research here and, and, and answer all our questions so uh, patiently. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank right. you. Thank you.